Good afternoon, and welcome to our 11th biannual RISE event. The theme today is Technology for Good, and we will be joined by Ms. Aditi Prasad and Dr. Rakesh Shalali. My name is Soyan Lee, and I'm the Advancement Director here at the American International School, Chennai, and it is my honor to welcome you. Before we get started, I'd like to ask everyone to silence their phones, so please take half a minute to do that. Um, Thanks. RISE stands for Resilience, Innovation, Service, and Entertainment. Our mission is to bring incredible thinkers to our school and to connect global issues to our school's mission. Technology touches so many aspects of our lives, and today we will hear two amazing case studies about how technology can be used for good. Ms. Prasad and Dr. Jalali embody the RISE acronym. They are resilient, solving problems in the face of challenges. They are innovative in their approaches to address complex problems. And they have been providing invaluable services to Chennai and India. We have been looking forward to this event for quite some time, and we're thrilled that you're all here with us today. So before I turn it over to Karan Ram, who will introduce our first speaker, I'd like to leave you with a question. How might we utilize technology for good? Good afternoon. My name is Karun Ram, and it gives me great honor to introduce our first RISE speaker, Ms. Aditi Prasad. Ms. Prasad has a BSL LLB law degree from the Indian Law Society, India and a master's in public policy from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, NUS, Singapore. Ms. Prasad is on a mission to inspire and educate young girls and boys to learn to code and develop real-world solutions for real-world challenges by harnessing the power of robotics, coding, STEM, and makerspaces to make school education more interactive and immersive. In India, where technical degrees often lead to better jobs, she is promoting educational pathways that lead to better careers and opportunities for girls. She's helping to make tech studies more approachable and fun, and creating game changers for girls in STEM. She was invited to be the keynote speaker at UNESCO's Policy Forum, held in Bangkok in August 2017, where she presented Cracking the Code, Girls' Education in STEM. She was also invited by TEDx Chennai India at its March 2018, and TEDx Mumbai India in March 2019, to talk about the Indian Girls' Code Initiative. She was also honored by the government of Singapore in September 2017 to be one of 15 young societal leaders selected from around the world for a global leadership event. Now, please join me in welcoming Ms. Prasad to the stage. On one thing. We are fortunate. Like most of us sitting here, I was privileged to be brought up in an environment that empowered me to be anything I wanted to be. From a very young age, my parents respected my sisters and my inquisitiveness and the choices we made. We were stubborn. I mean, we still are. We had to be. There was just a different way that girls were meant to act and behave. I still remember once my parents getting a call from school saying that I was too naughty because I preferred playing sports than anything else in school. While boys are raised to love sport and encouraged to pursue this kind of passion, for girls the story was very different. To survive in this male-dominated society where gender stereotyping is so strongly entrenched, we had to work hard and equip ourselves with the appropriate skills. Even today when I'm out at meetings and at a conference, I always, people are amazed and they ask me, wow, you work in robotics? Oh wow, you know how to code? You must be so smart. Which always gets me more stressed out and worried when instead I should be proud and happy. Why is a girl in robotics so shocking? In a sense, that's me right here in this meme. It's 2019 and very little has changed. 
Gender bias and stereotyping starts as early as four years of age, and especially in fields that boys traditionally dominate, young girls themselves hesitate to join. I once met a 14-year-old girl who dropped out of her STEM class purely because her friends were not part of the same class. In a government school very close by, 15-year-old girls all dropped out of their STEM class because their families thought it wasn't really useful and important for them to do so. Many parents do not opt for robotics and coding classes for their girls and would rather enroll them in dance, music, or art. Well, there's nothing wrong with the arts, of course, but these should be chosen voluntarily by boys or girls based on personal interest and ability, and not as a fallback option because they're wrongly deemed incapable of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. A recent survey conducted in schools where there's a 50-50 proportion of boys and girls in India, where science and math are mandatory, girls heavily outperform boys, science and math talkers are almost always girls but make these optional and the picture changes radically. Moving on to college, only 28.5% of women in India graduate with a STEM degree, big gender gap. By the time they get to the workplace, only 14.5% of women enter STEM jobs, even bigger gender gap. Remember, we started off at 50-50 at the school level. 50% of women then leave, uh, then leave employment between junior to mid-level careers and sometimes they never return. That means 50% of trained women stop contributing to the economy and adding that unique female perspective. But here's where the problem actually starts. According to World Economic Forum report, one in four adults reported a mismatch between the skills they have and the skills they need for their current job, which denotes a gap between the products of the education system and the expectation from today's technologically advanced workplace. Therefore, the big question is, which skills are you preparing yourself with? And as educators, parents, and role models, are we preparing our children with skills to meet the opportunities of the future? In the next 10 to 15 years, autonomous electrical vehicles, data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and shared economy businesses like Uber and Airbnb will change the complete landscape of countries and societies. These disruptive technologies offer unparalleled opportunities for risk takers and innovators. And we cannot leave the girls and women behind. We have to close that gender gap and digital divide right now. So my sister Deepti and I co-founded Indian Girls Code to inspire young girls to be innovators, creators, and leaders. We wanted to transform the education they received by giving them access to tech and coding skills and empowering them to be the change they wanted to see in the world. While our programs run across all sectors of society, we focus on the underprivileged girls who do not have access to quality education and who, under the pressure of poverty and tradition, may not even realize their own STEM skills. When children play with tools that they understand and have fun using in an environment that is free and independent, they develop confidence, curiosity, imagination, resilience, and persistence, building important 21st century skills like grit, critical thinking, collaboration, creativity, problem solving, while also developing STEM literacy. According to a Harvard Business Review report, the second most important motivator for girls in choosing a career is their ability to contribute to the well-being of society. So in the field of medicine, which is one of the most hardest industries to innovate due to just its pure complexity, is exactly what founder and director Sadaf Monijami has done. In 2017, she launched CMO Technologies, a medical tech startup that's helping doctors and medical professionals predict strokes in at-risk patients without conduct conducting multiple and really costly tests using AI and machine learning. Kathleen Yu was only 23 when she had the idea to use AI and machine learning algorithms to revolutionize talent recruitment. Now, Ruma Rocket is now an $8 million business that's solving the hiring needs of multinational clients all over the world. Sustainability and zero waste take the front seat in Elsa Bernadette's app. She's created an app in 2015, which is, this, which is Swedish's first app that con connects grocery stores, cafes, and restaurants to eager customers who want to buy unsold food at discounted prices. 
Identifying, creating and designing products and solutions for global good is a big opportunity for us. Giving girls access to technology that they can use to solve problems that they face in their community, city or country can ensure that they get excited about learning and creating technology. So we incorporate this need into our programs and we have dozens of inspiring stories. So in 2015, I went down to Trichy to visit an all-girls orphanage called Annai Ashram. These girls were from dysfunctional and underprivileged families. Their parents were prisoners, beggars, or victims of domestic abuse. A typical life cycle of a girl of this orphanage would be to finish free public school, join a local tailoring shop, get married to an equally poorly educated low-income earner, and send their children back to the same orphanage. It was a vicious cycle. At the launch of Indian Girls Code in Trichy, we spent time with the kids, explained explain to them about automation, robotics, <coughs> software, computers. I mean, something that we're all very familiar with. At one point, when we were showing kids automatic doors at a hotel, a young girl, confident as ever, gets up and asks in the local language Tamil, what does a hotel mean? It showed us quite starkly how much work we had to do and how privileged we all are to have access to all this information and education. The young girls at Anna Ashram, who had learned coding and robotics, wanted to create a home alarm system for their orphanage. Realizing that safety was an emotional concern, they solved a real-world problem using the technology that they had played with. These girls are inventors. 13-year-old Abhinaya, who wants to work in the Indian police force, wants to create a robot that can help rescue people. 10-year-old Mahalakshmi wants to invent a robot that helps old people. While 12-year-old Elakya wants to make a robot that will just make her lots of money. In the winter of 2015, Chennai was hit with a major flood. Homes were lost, the city was underwater, there was no electricity for days and normal life was completely disrupted. The children from a slum area very close by right here, they were emotionally and physically devastated from their experiences. A group of three kids came up to their teacher and said that they wanted to express what they had gone through using animation software that they had learned as part of their coding classes. This team of young journalists made a one and a half minute movie with 534 images, some clippings of newspaper and some drawings made by them. These kids were creators. All it took was a dream and the access to the right tools. And this is really our vision, to bridge the gender gap in STEM and the digital world, and to develop and promote the presence and contribution of women in the workspace, inspiring them to be innovators and leaders of a brighter tomorrow. Let me ask you all to join me and look really into the future, 10 years from today. If you could use all the tools, all the opportunities, the mentor, the education that you're receiving, what problem would you solve? And how hard are you willing to work to make that dream happen. And the best way to predict your, fe your future is to create it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Prasad. For our next speaker, we have Dr. Rakesh Jalali. Dr. Jalali is the medical director and head of radiation oncology at Apollo Proton Cancer Center. He is an internationally renowned key opinion leader in oncology, particularly known for high precision radiotherapy techniques. Over the years, he has done path-breaking research in the field of cancer treatment, enhancing the quality of life for cancer patients and developing appropriate research models. The neuro-oncology group at Tata Memorial Hospital was developed by Dr. Jalali. It is hailed as the finest such unit in India and recognized throughout the world. He was also instrumental in, est in establishing the Indian Society of Neuro-Oncology in 2008. Dr. Jalali served as its founding general secretary, then its president, and now chairs its senior advisory council. A much sought after speaker, Dr. Jalali is widely regarded for his teaching and for providing expert guidance to various national and international scientific meetings and professional societies. He is also well known for his commitment to charity and promoting equitable cancer care for patient populations in the developing world. 
Dr. Jalali founded the Brain Tumor Foundation of India, an internationally recognized charity organization dedicated to the welfare of patients with brain tumors and their families. He has over 300 publications. We are fortunate to have Dr. Jalali as part of our AISC parent community. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Rakesh Jalali. Thank you. I'd like to begin by expressing my gratitude to AISC, Swayon Lee in particular, who was kind enough to visit our center a few, few months ago along with some of the faculty, and that led to this beautiful occasion to be among with you today. You heard a rousing talk just, just now about the use of technology, and I'll dwell a little bit on in a different medical field as we proceed along the presentation. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about a relatively difficult medical condition, but unfortunately becoming very common, and it's called cancer. And some of you may be already familiar with the word, because I work in Apollo Proton Cancer Center, who I guess you would be passing by literally every day, if not twice a day. So the cancer cells are actually unregulated growth from any part of the body and any part of the tissue, and they're different than normal body cells because they divide in a different, in an orderly fashion while the cancer cells actually divide in an unorderly fashion. And they are unregulated, can be benign when they are localized at one place, but sometimes have the ability to infiltrate into the normal tissues and can also go to the other parts of the body and this is called metastasis or they are also called malignant tumors. There are several causes of cancer, about 40% of the cancers can develop sporadically without any known cause, but 50 to 60% of the cancers actually can be preventable, and the World Health Organization and many organizations around the globe have recognized that lifestyle changes as simple as use of, you know, abuse of tobacco, obesity, overweight, uh, there are different pathogens, physical activity, poor dietary habits, and so on and so forth. If you regularize, regularize them in your own daily routine, you can actually prevent cancer in about 50 to 60 percent of the cases. Unfortunately, however, the whole world, we are witnessing almost like an epidemic of this disease. A recent study done in five continents, over 21 countries, for the first time ever in the history of mankind, has revealed that cancer has overtaken as the major killer, and it superseded cardiovascular disease, which used to be the number one killer in high income and upper, lower and middle income countries. And as we know, a vast majority of the population is living in the developing world, and what is even more disconcerting, the, all the known risk factors, for example, tobacco, infection, nutrition, alcohol, hormones, occupation, radiation, and etc., are fortunately showing somehow decreased trend in HIC, the high-income countries, but in countries like India and, and countries like you know, the developing world, unfortunately, they are on the rise. And therefore, 70% of the cancer project, literally next year, is, is going to be in the lower and middle-income countries. Now, cancer burden in India per se, we see about, in the next year, we will see about 1.7 million cases. Cancer was never ever among the top 10 leading cause of death until about eight or nine years ago. And we have at any point out of three million, what is called prevalence at any point of time, how many cancer patients are there in the country. What is also very interesting is that cancer population registries in major metropolitan cities like Mumbai, Delhi, Chennai show about 120 to 150 or 160 cancer cases being detected every year per 100,000 population with a national average of about 100 per 100,000 every year. And interestingly, in the rural areas, it's only about 40 to 55 per 100,000, in spite of the fact that some of the rural countries, rural areas in India, we have a very robust program such that you don't miss out on these cases. And that shows some story as well, perhaps reflecting also about the environment, about the diet and the lifestyle in general that we have in the urban cities, urban areas as compared to the rural population. Now, once you do detect cancer and can affect any part of the body, then the classic treatments are you try to remove the, by surgery. There are also systemic therapies like you give drugs called chemotherapy and there's very recent just on immunotherapy. And radiation therapy also is an integral component of the cancer care. And about 60 to 70% of the cancer patients receive radiation at some point of time, either radically or sometimes palliative to take care of the symptoms. The classic 
treatment that we use for radiation therapy is called a photon or an X-ray. And this has the property of some electromagnetic spectrum. They travel at the speed of the light, but they are ionizing form of radiation. And then when they interact with the, with the cells or the human tissue, they actually release free radicals. And the cancer cells are rapidly proliferating, and therefore the free radicals actually kill the cancer cells there and spare the normal tissues. And this has been going on for many years, ever since Ronchin discovered X-rays in 1895, and the photon or X-rays have been in treatment for the last many, many years. The classic conventional radiation is called photon or X-ray, is delivered by a machine called a linear accelerator, and you do a fair bit of these days with the help of 3D anatomy, with the help of high quality MRI scans and PET scans and CT scans, you construct the tumor. We have very elegant, robust supercomputer type of computers which can actually plan the treatment very well and with the help of these beams, you can treat the tumor and spare the normal tissues. And this has been kind of the workhorse which I've been using for the last 30, 40 years. And there has been a fair bit of evolution of photon radiotherapy itself. Uh, ever since, for example, I was a student, I joined Radiation Oncology in 1991, and in the last 25, 27 years, what used to happen is a classic graphic that we show. This is actually the tumor in this particular instance, the prostate cancer is wrapping around the rectum, which is a very important organ, and you want to spare the rectum. And when we were students, we used to shine the beams in such a way that the entire prostate cancer is treated by the radiation, but you can imagine the rectum gets an equal amount of dose, and which is obviously not good. As the evolution of the technology, even in the photon world, evolved, that you got better and better, and you can see in the latest photon technology, you give a beautiful dose distribution only to the prostate and spare the rectum. But mind you, there's a fair amount of what we call low and intermediate dose of radiation with the photon in the surrounding structures as well, even in the, in the, in the very highly evolved photon radiation technique that we have. And that brings to another aspect of cancer care, which is particularly close to my heart. It is the cancer survivorship. It's not only enough for survival, but it's also the cancer survivor, how well the cancer patients survive. So childhood cancer survivor story actually is an excellent example. So childhood cancers in general, about 70 to 80% can be completely cured. And when I say cured, they have the ability to live normal lifespans of 70, 80, 90 years as per the individual society. A large study in the US, however, showed of more than 10,000 patients that although they do live long, about 60% or do have one chronic medical issue because of either because of the tumor per se, but also could be because of the treatment. And a quarter of them could be even severe and life-threatening. And that could be because of surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, and so on and so forth. So there has been a paradigm shift in the last few years. What we say we not only cure, but the quality of cure is absolutely critical as well. So in many diseases, we try to reduce the effects of treatment to reduce on the heart, the organ preservation, we don't amputate the limbs, we don't remove the breast these days, we, the, such that the people can uh, you know, swallow, they have the intact larynxes, they have what's called functional outcome of chewing, swallowing, speech, gait, talking, what is called activities of daily living. And how do we achieve it? What we do is we have what we call de-escalation treatment strategies. We try to evolve a treatment paradigm which necessarily did not give a very high intense treatment. Try to give rest treatment. And that is based on improved surgical skill and also on what is called molecular signature driven therapy that each individual cancer patient has a unique molecular profile. So you personalize the therapy, what's called personalized therapy. And finally, a very high precision radiation therapy, including protons. Now proton per se, is not unique or it's not like a very new science. It was discovered many, many years ago and Robert Wilson wrote the first paper in 1948. And as compared to the conventional X-rays which enters the medium, for example, in the human body, and then it gives a certain dose to the tumor, but there is always a little bit of exit dose which causes dose to the other parts of the body as you saw in the previous picture and unfortunately leads a little bit of side effect. The proton, because it's a positive charge, it's not neutral or negative like photon, it enters the body, there's a lesser entrance dose when, you, when it enters into the body. And because it's a light chain, light ion, depending upon the distance it travels and depending upon the energy, at some point of time it deposits all of its ionization, ionization energy and then this has a classic fall off which is called, there is absolutely what's called zero dose beyond the tumor. So there is literally no normal tissue will receive any dose at all. 
and this is impossible to achieve in photon that was the technology what was discovered many years ago so we had what is called the Bragg peak uh, named after William Bragg William Bragg and his son are the only father and son duo who won Nobel Prize, both of them, on physics. And they were the first ones to discover this Bragg peak. So we knew it for many years, and the first facility was associated with the University of Berkeley in Loma Linda in, 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 uh, in, in California in the US, and then subsequently was in Uppsala, Sweden, CERN and PSI in Zurich, and some centers in Japan and Korea. The, the challenge, however, was that it was largely related to a physics and a very intense resource, intense physics laboratory system. And the technique what we used to use was a passive scanning technique. And the passive scanning technique was like a torch. So you have a torch and you show a beam, but the tumors, of course, are not like so large. So you use a trimmer and a metal and tungsten, what is called the collimator, such that you have the beam like the tumor shape it is. And unfortunately, therefore, the contraptions, the paraphernalia associated with it reminds you almost like a 70s sci-fi film or a Star Trek film, and therefore it was not very popular in the medical sciences. The revolution took place about 10 to 12 years ago, and that is very critical and very exciting for the technology, which is the theme of this event as well. So the modern proton therapy, instead of using a torch, uses a very small spot of three millimeter, almost like a laser pointer. And then what it does is it uses this pencil beam technology depending upon the energy. So you use a very, very high energy b before and uh, I hope the movie plays. Yeah, that's it. So what it does is that it literally paints the tumor in a three dimensional space with the maximum energy at the right point. So it just paints it like we'd say point by point layer by layer, such that the entire tumor in the three dimensions, and now in the moving organ in the four dimension, can be beautifully encapsulated by the radiation dose that you do, such that you achieve, which is, was a dream when we were a student, that ultra precise dose painting to the most complex tumor shape there might be. And because of the radio biological and physics property of the proton, there is virtually no dose whatsoever to the surrounding tissues. And therefore, this revolution really change the whole world of proton. It needed a very elegant, sophisticated treatment planning algorithms, both used for optimization and calculation, and also used a daily CT scan, which is inbuilt into the system, such that every day when the patient comes and the treatment is about four to five weeks every day. So we overlay the CT scan picture that we generate in the proton machine with the previous film. If the error is more than a millimeter or sub-millimeter, we cannot actually even start the machine. So this enabled what is called image-guided modern pencil beam proton therapy, and that has made a huge stride in the world. Therefore, in 1970s and 80s, there were hardly a smattering of proton centers, and now it has zoomed in the last four or five years, and Chennai joined the ranks very, 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 very soon, earlier on 2nd of January, and about 20 to 25% of the cancer patients are likely to benefit from this technology. Apollo Proton Cancer Center, which is just across the street here, was, in all, was the building started in 2016. I'm sure some of you may have passed by this building when it was being built. And as you know, in November, this is, the, this is the story now. It was a humongous task to bring the technology to a country like ours. But, and this is the only center in the entire South Asia, right from the Middle East Gulf until Australia. And the second center is likely to come in Mumbai two years from now. And next year, the third center in this region will come in Singapore. And that's why it is a matter of pride for at least Taramari 100 feet road that we have the AISC and we have the Proton Cancer Center. So we... <laughs> two great institutions, if I, if, if I you will. So we started on 2nd of... Uh, second of January, we get the machine only for eight hours because of our IBA Belgium technologists, you know, who the physicists who run it, they need it for maintenance and putting the other two rooms. So we could treat only about eight to nine patients a day. But in a record time, you know, fortunately, because of the numbers and the technology that we were having, and now on 26 September, we started the second room. We have already crossed the 100. We had a party two weeks ago crossing the 100 patients. And we have a fair number of patients waiting from all over the globe. Unfortunately, you can't see it, but you trust me, this was a picture to showing 27% of these patients are pediatrics. And I'll tell you in a minute why pediatrics. And we have a fair number of patients who we have to immobilize in a mask because you cannot move. But very young children, leaving them alone in the room, you need a little bit of short course safe anesthesia to, to overcome it. And I'll show you some interesting uh, interesting pictures. This was a very difficult sacral, you know, in the back. 
a tumor which could not be operated upon. We gave the best photon technology, which also, by the way, we have a machine, what's called tomotherapy. And this gives the dose, red is the dose that you need to kill the tumor. But you see the collateral damage that it causes even with the best technology of photon. And then you run a proton plan, and even you can tell us that how beautiful it is that it just encaps, you know, just encapsulates the tumor with complete sparing of the femoral heads, the bladder, the bowel, and the surrounding structures, and therefore it is very attractive. One of the most complex radiation planning in a childhood brain tumor, which is actually my field, is when we have to treat the whole brain and the entire spine. And you can see how the spine is in a circular, you know, in a helical fashion. And one, once we used to give photons, they used to treat the red one, but we used to give a lot of dose to the gonads, to the testes, to the to the in a, in a boy or to the ovaries in a girl and these are very young children unfortunately and therefore this is the proton plan so you give a very good dose there is complete sparing of the heart the thyroid the kidneys the mouth the esophagus the the liver and the gonads as i said including into the anterior vertebra which is absolutely critical for the growth of the patient so therefore is the is is the power of the proton one more very young child i treated it was a central tumor in the pituitary gland and it's extremely difficult to treat because you always end up giving doses to a very important structure called hippocampus, which is the seat of cognition and memory in a growing child. And here there's absolutely no dose to the hippocampi whatsoever. And this was again a very good technique. This was our first child actually treated in the South Asia with this tumor and he also became a celebrity because his story came in all over the place. And there is data from St. Jude's Hospital in Memphis, which is one of the finest children cancer hospitals in the world. In the, uh, and they showed that if you look at the proton data, there is no fall in the reading and academic score and math score. As compared to the photon, we always used to see a dip in their academic scholastic achievements as compared to the proton, therefore the power of proton. We also did a fair bit of research in my previous organization where we found out what is called level one evidence. We did a randomized trial, randomly allocating half the children treated with conventional radiation, half the children treated with high precision radiation and found out there was indeed a superiority of giving lesser dose to the normal tissues as compared to others. This was one of the youngest children. I have treated an 11 month old child as well, but three year old child, this was our third patient with a pelvic sarcoma where otherwise we would have treated again a fair amount of tissue including into the testes and that could have caused growth problems as, as he grew. So all children, teenagers, young adults, for that matter any patient who is likely to have a long-term cure must be considered for proton therapy. And vast majority of the world, for example, this is an example of a Stockholm pediatric proton therapy consensus group and the blue is proton and red is photon. As you can see, these are the common childhood cancers where the world is switching over to proton because of the beauty of the technology. Even in the moving organs, whenever you have moved, for example, lung cancer like here, the beam actually follows the movement of the lung. It's in the four dimension to an accuracy of a submillimeter, and therefore the proton is very attractive for these organs as well. In the head and neck cancers, you hardly see any loss of taste. Breast cancer used to be, we don't, as I said, in the photon, there is always a little bit of dose to the, to the heart, but in proton, you literally have zero dose and it has again a very important organ. So therefore, there's a significant impact of modern proton therapy literally in all parts of the body. Cost effectiveness, there's a very intense to put up a proton machine and therefore in, the, in a Marco model, which some of you may be knowing, it's an economic model, you look at the initial investment and look at the returns, not only in terms of the cure, but also the swallowing, the function, the ability to go, employment, education, contribution to the society, and in many, many cancers, proton actually is cost effective. And is particularly relevant for people like you, adolescent and young adults, where we have witnessed in the past there were issues with education, employment, percent per cohabiting with a partner and how to <coughs> overcome the social taboos, equal opportunities, better cancer techniques, and at least the better technology can at least chip in. A good number of cancer patients unfortunately also develop second cancers because of photon radiation, and this has been significantly reduced as to 30% to just 4% with the proton technology. This is the machine that we have, the cyclotron, where we get the hydrogen ion, we extract the the, 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 uh, the electron out of it and the proton is generated and then it goes to the treatment, the beam transport system with the help of it is in vacuum because the proton is like a child, you know, it's sometimes a wild child, you have to put in the vacuum with the quadrupole and dipole magnets and treats on the first room the switching of the beam to, and you have to actually come and see it. If between the two, it takes exactly 17 seconds 
and you can treat three patients simultaneously. The beam comes only once, but you can treat potentially three patients at one point of time. The, patient, the treatment room actually is very, very simple. We have a Leonie French robotic couch because you have to be absolutely accurate. You have these monitors, you have the system x ray tubes, and other aligned RTs to make sure that the treatment is delivered where you want to deliver. Every single patient so far we have treated is in a prospective clinical research. Uh, that's absolutely critical because each patient's data is critical for us. The patient reported outcomes what the quality of life, the patient's experience in all these patients so far has been very, very encouraging. It's either maintained or getting better. And this is the entire hospital. There's a cancer center attached to it with the, with the mandate of providing high quality of service and also academic and research. I leave with you with two slides. This is the charity that had been involved since 1999 after I came from, from UK to India. And this is dedicated for children in brain tumors. We have an art festival. Actually, we made a movie and you can see the movie. It's, on, it's, on, it's an animation movie discussing the treatments of radiation, chemotherapy and surgery uh, in, in, in a childhood cancer. It's on YouTube. It's called Bus Technoma. And finally, in technology, as was shown by one of the pioneers, Marie Curie, therapy should be permanently backed by scientific research, without which no progress is possible. And the search for pure knowledge is one of the most important needs for mankind. And we do have formidable challenges of cancer, as I said, not only in the curing the cancer, but also the quality of cure. And you, will, you are in such a great institution, I, have, I can't say enough because I'm an AIC parent as well. A great institution and each day and each week and each month would be a beautiful learning because once, even if you have a formidable challenge in your life, like the Saving Proton Center, think like a proton, stay positive. Thank you.